you join me in my shed, uh, which is uh, my sometime office. Um, and um, hopefully it won't get too noisy when the kids come out, come out before they go to bed. <laughs> I might have to shut the door in a minute. So we'll just give it until two or three minutes past just to, uh, there's still lots of people. What do you mean sound? There's no sound. Uh, Florian can hear me. Uh, sound is good. Are you, are you just tr trying to wind me up? You know, I'm not nervous at all. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Yeah, it's the first one we've done of these, so it's uh, hi Colin and Helen, <laughs> hi Jules, oh, there's lots of, hi Nigel, lots of people that, that I don't know as well. <laughs> so far, so good. Hi Mark. Right, I think we should probably crack on then. Um, it's uh, a couple of minutes past, so uh, what? <laughs> There's no, yeah, there'll be comedy. But I've had at least um, a glass of wine and a half, so uh, so so it should be should be fine. <laughs> Take up slack. Okay, I will do. Cheers, John. Um, right. So, <clears throat> what I'd like to concentrate on tonight is um, is is the bit between that we all know about. Uh, that, that we all call getting away from the launch and of course some of you will, be, will launch from from a winch and some will launch from from Erito. so I'm, I'm hoping to deal with both of those two methods tonight um before we start um we'll just have a quick look at a slide about how to use this software because we've had a few queries over the uh, over the last few um uh, last few presentations and um uh, including you uh, people that, that have had a problem um, with the with the feedback uh, with the uh, Q and A and the and the comments on the right hand side there. So if you can't see the comments and the um, uh, and the text box on the right hand side with all the with all the people that have joined us tonight, then you need to to um, unhide that that chat sidebar because hopefully I'm going to ask that um, there's a little bit of feedback tonight and uh, get a little bit of uh, of chat from you guys as well. That's that's the aim. Um, if you want to ask a question specifically, then you need to click on the uh, the question uh, little icon at the bottom there, and that'll come up as a question on the right, um, and then. Um, we can we can make that large on the screen if uh, if need be. Um, John Gatfield, no, it's not Odium. It's um, uh, where is it? Mildenhall, I think. Uh, okay, so hopefully you've seen enough of that of all that stuff. Let's move on to what we're going to be actually talking about tonight. Um, so hopefully it'll be about forty minutes. Maybe some questions at the end. We'll see. Um, so type, types of launch and why we might pick that type of launch, um, when we should choose to launch, um, and how high we should launch if we're towing, and some tips about actually launching, where to find the lift, um, and a little bit about um, ferrometer misconceptions as well. And uh, I might do a little bit of practical if we've got time as well on that on that side of things as well. So uh, for those of you that have not met me before, um, this is me. I've been a glider pilot for many years um, and I've never been a commercial pilot or a military pilot or any of those kind of things. So I've learned everything from uh, from the ground up as a, as a bog standard glider pilot and got into soaring um, 
very early on. Absolutely loved it. Um, absolutely loved doing expeditions, flying all over the place. Um, you, those that know me will 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 recognise that you know if I can fly, then I'll fly. I, I'm not. Uh, my my day job is uh, is working for the BGA, but uh, if I can fly, then I'll uh, then I'll always fly if I can. I love flying. I still love flying, even even after many thousands of hours. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Um, okay, so moving on to the type of launch. Now, a lot of you will um, be able to do both types of launch, and some of you will perhaps only be able to. Um, enjoy one type of launch or the other so let's just deal to start with with uh with winching to start with so how can we how do we know when we should set off uh, on the winch launch well we need to be sure that we can actually saw once we've once we've taken our launch there's no point if the if the um if the aim is to saw, then there's no point in taking a launch if we can't saw. Um, so, how do we know when we can actually set off and go and go? Uh, and how do we know when we can saw? So that's the that's really the first question. Uh, let me just move my slides down here. So, when should we actually set off on on this on this winch launch? So can you guys tell me on the uh, on the text box down there what kind of things we should be looking for when we set off um on our winch launch or before we commit to actually taking this winch launch so birds circling yeah that's great nearby queue possibly um yeah good cumulus other soaring approaching likely cloud yeah other air traffic, streeting, <laughs> sun on the ground. Yeah, I think that's that's probably pretty important. Why do you reckon sun on the ground is one of the most important things? Gust changes. Yeah, changes the wind direction on the ground. Like, why do you reckon this? You know. A, a good amount of sun on the ground is important, not just the cumulus in the air. I'm just looking at all the comments coming through now. Yeah, because that creates the thermals, exactly. So it's no good if there's a really good cumulus. Sometimes we get huge cumulus um, forming over the uh, over the end of the, the airfield. But the trouble with that is that we tend to be fairly low and um it's really the cumulus uh, it's really the, the lift lower down that we need and if we look at the way thermals the, the kind of life cycle of, of a thermal then we start off with this bubble that's close to the ground and then hopefully if we get a really good thermal going then we end up with this um this kind of thermal bubble that also sucks all the warm air around it from the ground as well but then later on what can happen is that if we we can if we're up by cloud base then that thermal is still working up up by the cloud but lower down it's not working at all so unfortunately in that situation we might take our winch launch and go underneath the cloud but it's not but, but there's nothing there and that has it has anybody has anybody ever seen a glider above them but being perhaps a thousand feet below or something like that and not being able to connect with that climb has, has anybody ever had that situation going on yeah a few <laughs> a few a few yeses going on many times yeah so the reason for that is because the cloud and the the circulation of the uh, of the thermal is still going on up high, but it's not actually reaching the ground. So if we're going to take a winch launch, then one of the problems is that um, we need that new thermal, or 
a kind of half mature thermal really to take us from the ground level up into the, the real climb itself. So we really need sunshine on the ground to do that. And we'll have a look at the way we can use cumulus and sunshine together in a, in a minute. Um, so a lot of you perhaps fly from, but th th this applies to aerotowing as well. And we'll go back to, and we'll talk about aerotowing in a minute. Um, a lot of you may um, know some thermal triggers that might, that might work and that are known to you around the airfield. So what I'm going to try and do is write some of your thermal triggers down. So if you can give me a little bit of feedback again, then I'll write some of your thermal triggers down here. So if, you, if you've got known thermal triggers around your airfield, so woods, launches, yeah, because the launches themselves can, um, can produce thermals, you know, um, disturbing the, the ground. Oh, my God, they're all coming thick and fast. Uh, industrial estates. Uh, what else we got? Runways, yeah. I'll just have them not getting them all. <laughs> Pig farms. Yeah. Um, sun shadow. Yeah. Um, south facing slopes. Yeah, what else have we got? Um, edge of the ridge, kind of similar to south facing slopes, I guess. Um, tractors and fields. Yeah, lakes. Yeah, how does that work? We'll, we'll cover some of these in a minute. Lakes. Um, sea. Okay, Tom, I might unmute your, uh, your microphone in a minute and ask you to explain that. Sea. Um, High ground, the winch launch, yeah. Edge of the sun shadow, I think we've got most of these. What else we got? Edge of the ridge, brown fields, classic, yeah. It might be that I miss, I misspell some of this stuff. Uh, quarry, yeah. Oh, towns, yeah. Um, okay, so let's 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 deal with some of these. So woods. Um, oops, get rid of that. Um, has anybody ever been for a walk in a wood um, in the morning? How how what does that what does it feel like? Does it does it feel cooler than the surrounding air when you walk into the wood in the morning, or does it feel warmer? This is really strange. Not doing it in a room for the people. <laughs> <laughs> Just waiting for some responses. Oh, there must be a lot of typing going on. Just going to sh shut the door to me shed. So is it colder? Is it colder in the wood in the morning than the surrounding air, or is it warmer in the wood? Lots of people typing, but nothing coming up on the. Oh, sorry, I haven't scrolled to the bottom. That's why. Colder, right? Yes, I got I got there in the end. Excellent. <laughs> so it's colder, exactly. So woods tend to be good, um, perhaps a bit later on, because how does it feel? Yeah, trees stop the sun getting through, exactly. But in the evening, have you ever been for a walk in the woods? In the evening, when the surrounding air started to cool down, what's it feel like in the woods? I found woods better later in the day. Yeah, exactly. Because, yeah, Ray Lewis thinks it's warmer in the woods in the evening. Yeah. Um, so woods tend to be better in the evening. And if you can go over a certainly medium-sized woods, not massive forests, because they tend to be un uniformly heated in that in that case. But if you go into woods, if you go over woods later on in the day, then they can be really, really good triggers uh, in the afternoon. What we got here, trees act as a blanket. Yeah, warm, great thermal in the evening. Edge of the wood can trigger off. Yeah, exactly. Save me late on. Yeah, save me late on as well, Andrew. Yeah. Um, let's have a look. Uh, industrial estates. 
Um, yeah, they can be good. Just generally lots of concrete around, lots of uh, surfaces um, facing the uh, facing the the sun, so they they can heat up um, ununiformly, I suppose. Uh, runways are excellent as well. Yeah, who's ever turned final, um, which often tends to be downwind of the the big runway uh, that that you've taken off from and taken. Um, uh, well, not taken. Obviously, you wouldn't. You would. You would never turn final and, and take a climb, would you? But you know, being through a big bump, and you thought, "Oh, that's where the thermal was." So, has, has ever, anybody ever done that? Um, yeah, yeah, a few yeses. Okay. So, the <laughs> so the reason for that is that the the uh, airfield, your airfield, tends to be well drained, even if it's a grass airfield. Um, it can be well drained. Um, our airfield, we try really hard to, to drain it, so it's probably better drained than uh, than the surrounding area. So it can be that that is the best place actually to find a good thermal, especially off an aerotone. Now, I'm not suggesting that people go off the top of the winch launch and then go straight downwind, you know, downwind of the of the runway because that's you don't want to be searching downwind first. That's a bad place to search. But if all else fails, it might be somewhere that you can try if you're high enough uh, and um, and if it's safe to do so. Um, yeah, pig farms, again, um, lots of good stuff. And often, actually, you can expect anybody flown from Benella, and there's a big pig, pig farm off the end of one of the ridges at Benella. And when you fly into the thermal, you don't actually need to use the barrier you can smell it so you can just <laughs> start turning in the uh, in in the smell and you know that you're you're in the decent uh, in the in the decent thermal there sun shadows yeah because we're looking for differences in, in temperature because that's how the thermals work we need a difference in temperature to um uh, and that instability to give us the uh, the good climbs um south facing slopes yeah absolutely has anybody got has anybody heard of um, of wind shadow thermals? Anybody heard of that? Uh, how can I just... So wind shadow thermals, let me try and... <clears throat> Oops. I thought, I thought I'd messed up the whole job then. But I hadn't. Right. So here's a ridge, great ridge there, and but the wind is blowing in this direction. So, um, normally you would expect all the air to be going down the hill, and it does. If you're close to the ridge, then this is not going to work. If you're flying your glider along here, um, we're we're going to get sucked down by an invisible hand of death. Um, but if you happen to be up here, flying your glider, then the reason I've done this in the corner is because I've got some dialogue boxes <laughs> open. <laughs> so it might look a bit strange. Anyway, um, um, what what can happen? Is, again, has anybody, has anybody walked up a hill like this, maybe not quite so steep as this, and felt how warm it feels especially sorry i should probably put the sun here um how warm it feels when the sun shining on this westerly slope when the wind is is in that direction and what you tend to get is a, a hot spot on the side of the, the ridge even when as long as you're high enough to to get this thermal that's triggered off from this hot spot you can get quite a good wind shadow thermal. And even something like, uh, oh, I'm struggling to think, um, you know, the the ridge at um, uh, Port Moak, uh, Bishop, Bishop Hill. Um, when the sun's shining on that ridge, um, even when there's a gentle uh, easterly wind blowing, you can get thermals triggering off all the way down that ridge. So, yeah, you obviously don't want to be trying this down. Yeah, height is the key there, quite right. We don't want to be trying this down close to the ridge, but 
when the sun's shining on the ridge and there's a gentle uh, breeze blowing off um, in the wrong direction normally, uh, then you can get these wind shadow thermals uh, downwind of the ridge as long as you're high enough. Please don't try this too low because you'll get stuck down. <laughs> anyway, where were we? Um, yeah, south facing slopes, obviously they're good because they, they warm up and you've got the advantage of being able to saw them as well. Tractors and fields, yeah, they can kick off. They, you know, they tend to be warm, but also they're kicking off the thermals because there's just that disturbance. Um, lakes, why? How do lakes work? Well, you can uh, you can do another whiteboard thing. How do I get rid of all that? This might take some time. I right, won't go any further. Matt, I've forgotten how to do another whiteboard. <laughs> oh, hold on a minute. That'll do it. Right. Um, yeah. So, um, if you've got a if you've got a lake um, like this, then you get this kind of if we if that's looking down on the lake and this is the side view, then we can get this kind of. There's the water sat in the sat in the lake. Then you can get this kind of layer of cold air sitting over the top of the lake. But what that tends to do is trigger off the thermals. And so we've got warm air coming along here if the wind's blowing in this direction. And you can get, as long as this lake's not too big, you can get thermals triggered off where the land heats the uh, uh, where the land meets the the, the lake um if this the, if this um lake is too big then it tends to just blank off the uh um you know the whole area downwind of it and it, it's just too big it's too stable it's too cold and it messes up the whole job but um if it's a small body of water then you can get get thermals um triggering off goes to the edge of the lake tom yeah exactly um what size is small? Well, I don't know. Less less than less than a kilometre long or something like that. Less than half a kilometre long. Props, something like that. Anybody well, want to help me out with their experience? There's a few experienced pilots on here as well. A small village. Blithfield works. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Blithfield can work, can't it? And that's about what? Yeah, a runway length, a kilometre long or something like that. So yeah, you can get these um, these thermals working. What else have we got? The sea. Tom, right then. I wonder if I can unmute your microphone. There you go. There you go, Tom. You can talk. If you unmute your microphone, you can talk now and tell us about soaring the sea. I hope. Is it gonna work? Hello. So, Tom, you need to find your red, your red um, microphone button and, un and unmute that. No, you shouldn't need to be made a presenter. No, I don't know. There we go. We can hear you. You can hear me now? Yeah, got you. Uh, having flown over the sea for many years at Leon Solent, if you went to the edge of the shore and the sea, it always find the thermals will kick off along that shoreline and there'd be like a ski slope as you um, went inland. Um, and it was almost guaranteed to work. Um, and we'd soar out over the sea to the Isle of Wight, you know, on a good day, especially in a northerly. But you do it in a southerly as well. Um, okay. Just my, my experience um, flying low level at Leon Solent in weak lift you had to go and find anything that was happening. Um, you even got the thermals out in the middle of the the, um, the Solent between Isle of Wight and the mainland. Um, and it's some days it's quite amazing what you could actually saw in. So, I wonder if um, that's also because of this, we've got this, you know, um, the, the, the thermal bubble carrying on up by cloud base as well, and that's drifting out to sea as well. There is, is that as well. <clears throat> 
but it's a temperature differential that you've got to look for and a cloudy day as you can still saw under a fully clouded day um you're looking for the darker patches the same as you're like looking for the queue yeah so yeah you know ex explore my my philosophy on launching is have a plan a b and c so you look for a cloud look for another cloud and then you're looking for something else um and getting away from low down going and saving yourself in fields and that you've got to look for those triggers and those temperature differences absolutely and the pa patches especially when there's lots of cloud around the patches of sunlight and we'll we'll talk about that in a sec <laughs> all right thanks okay. Tom. That's Thank great. You. right cool that worked amazing okay where are we? oh no not that yet <laughs> okay triggers um see brown fields yeah obviously nice nice warm areas quarries especially when the, the and probably only actually when they when they face the sun and towns yeah as long as the town's not too big if if it's a massive town then you need to search along the edges um of the town uh, but yeah there's some brilliant examples of there and it uh, speaking specifically about getting away um it's always a really good idea to talk to your um local kind of pilots pundits or instructors and just see you know what what they what they use what they can use because certainly at all the airfields i've ever flown with uh, flown at you can normally go to uh, you can normally get some advice and they'll say yeah that bowl works in you know in the um in the afternoon or the morning or whatever and try the industrial estate at cyford um even on the opposite side of the airfield at cyford where i fly there's um there's a, a there's a big long runway and that can be really a really good trigger as well so um ask the locals ask your instructors and have a plan before you set off because um just you know launching up and hoping that you bumble into something is probably not, not the best thing to do um uh, shall we do aerito now let's let's do this just talking a little bit more about triggers and the way thermals form i mean this is obviously a um a, a cloud street here but you, you can often get cloud streets forming obviously when, when you're trying to get away and often on the up up sun side of the cloud street so the wind's blowing up and down this cloud street but on the sunny side of the cloud street you get a a shadow forming from the top of the cloud down to the cloud down to the uh, down to the ground and what happens is that this cloud street will actually move into wind during the day because the thermals will form on the upwind side of the cloud street because there'll be sink on this side probably and they the thermals will form on this side and you'll get the new bubbles forming on the up sun side and if you search along the, the shadow line um, then you'll probably find that new thermal coming up from the ground and obviously that's the thermal that you want the other thing about uh, cumulus when we're trying to get away especially from a winch launch is that when we look up into the uh, up at the cloud we tend to look and to, i can't see any of you so you don't need to to uh, feel uh, feel feel stupid about this but if you look up to a natural angle you can see me though <laughs> if you look up to a natural angle you'll find that that angle is probably about 70 degrees or something like that so what a lot of people do is that they tend to launch the cloud base you know they, they may have been delayed and they're not launching in the morning so they might be launching um except if you um peak gill and then you launch absolutely when the first thermal happens but um if you launch uh, a bit later on then you find that the cloud base is quite a lot above you and you'll find that if you look up and think you're underneath the cloud you're not actually there yet so even if you're trying to go for this next more mature thermal here um you'll find that you're not actually under the cloud when you think you are so you, one the next tip is actually to look up and make sure you're underneath the, the cloud if you can um and in fact just sticking with winches for a little while winching for a little while um 
this is a has, has any any of you ever either said or heard um god especially after a winch launch and somebody's landed back after a winch launch god they sink everywhere anybody anybody ever heard that no Ooh, emails coming in yes 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 oh yes about 100 times always at north hill yeah yeah okay so if you hear that then there are a few things that we can do especially as instructors and if, if you're a ab initio pilot to try and reduce the reduce that happening so the next question i'm going to ask you is and it's on here so i don't need to ask you the question really but around all sink around all lift there tends to be sink yeah exactly so if we ping off the top of the winch launch we might get to say i don't know 1200 feet or something like that if we're lucky and we might start cruising on towards what might look like a good area of lift it might be a cloud it might be a good trigger on the ground or something like that but if it's a cloud we we'll look we we'll look up at the cloud and we might even while we're in the sink think ah we're underneath the cloud because we've only looked up at you know 70 degrees and we're way below cloud base we'll look up at the cloud and think well i'm underneath the cloud but where's the but where's the lift there's no lift right and also this wing is probably in better air than this wing which means that the glider kind of automatically starts easing itself off towards the next cloud so you end up in this situation where the glider's kind of turning by itself you're in strong sync you think you're under the cloud and there's another cloud over here perhaps if you're lucky um so you think oh well oh, that didn't work so i'll go to the next one so you cruise on towards the next one and exactly the same thing happens but also in this situation here you might be down to i don't know 900 feet or something i don't know if i'm doing 900 on here <laughs> my trackpad um so you might be down to 900 feet or something and you're starting to worry about you know quite rightly about getting into the circuit which you should be <laughs> um but the, the problem is that you're now in the sink again because you think you're underneath the next cloud and it's not working again and you might even try the same thing in the in cloud three as well so unfortunately by the time you've turned base all you've been in during the whole flight is lots of sync or just you know zeros and you know it doesn't work so how can we how can we try and avoid that well once we've pinged off the top of the winch launch for instance and we'll talk about aerotone in a minute um we need to make sure as long as it's safe and you know we need to keep looking back towards the airfield and making sure that we're, we're actually going to be able to make it but if we can search upwind first because if we do get into this this thermal then even if it's weak we're going to be thermaling like this and it's going to be taking us back towards the airfield so that's a good thing so try upwind first if you can look towards you know if there's a decent cloud recognize that you might need to go to the up sun side of the shadow on the ground to get that new that new thermal coming coming up at you it might be that if the cloud base is a bit low you might be lucky and you'll get the the, the lift that's going up into the cloud but you need to make sure look absolutely vertically above you and make sure that you are actually underneath the cloud the other thing is make sure that you are not influenced by the thermal underneath this this wing as well make sure that you the glider is actually going in the direction you want it to go so if somebody's put there andy yeah press on if the sink there will be lift keep going yeah and that that's the other thing you know that there's probably going to be sink around the thermal so if the sink uh, yeah if the sink then that's actually a good sign as long as it's safe to get back towards the airfield of course you need to keep checking that but if the sink then you just keep going because it's following the model you're going towards the cloud you're looking vertically upwards you're not quite underneath the cloud yet the sink that's a good thing the sink around all lift so hopefully you'll get some lift in a minute if you keep going so if you actually fairly single-minded and go towards the lift then you'll probably be 
uh, slightly more uh, successful, perhaps. But this happens, I think, absolutely constantly. You know, everybody said it happens all the, all the time, and I, I really think that this 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 is a really common uh, model. Um, okay, let's before we go on to that next slide, let's just go back and talk about aerotowing. Um, I should, I've got some. Um, how are we doing for time? Oof, time's getting on. Presentation. Got some. Some. Uh, let's try. Right, when we're talking about aerotowing, what I'd like you to do um, is have a look at the the survey I've just put up, and um, and answer the questions there. I can't remember what. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's it. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes. We've got some some answers coming in. We'll just check the notes while there's a few answers coming in. Oh, I've missed loads out. <laughs> okay, that'll do. So, um, what we got on the right here? Um, more than nine, and yeah, more than nine, possibly. Two knots more than the rate of climb you get behind the tug. Hmm, maybe. It does depend on the tug. It does. So let's have a look then. Uh, shall we end the voting there and share the results? There we go. Right, hopefully everybody can see what I'm what I can see now. So um how much lift indicate well of course, yeah, as somebody's put on the right there, it does depend on the tug. But Behind our Pawnee, if you're flying a, even if you're flying our Janus, then you'll normally be going up at about, you know, five, six knots behind the Pawnee, uh, a bit less behind something less powerful. Um, but, you know, we, we're talking averages here. So a lot of, some of you have said six knots. It depends on the tug. But what you've got to remember is that let's say we're towing at five knots indicated okay let's just take that that figure at that speed what speed does the glider descend at if you were to um release the toe and well let's use round figures let's say it's two knots normally the glider will come down at two knots or a bit less if you're on you know in a posh machine so if you're going up at five knots then you need at least six or seven knots of of indicated lift behind the toe so that you will stop sinking when you release am i making myself <laughs> clear there so once you release you're going to sink then at two knots say so you need more than that in order to climb so if you're tone at five knots the sink rate's two knots so if you release at seven knots sink uh, lift rate then you're going to be uh, in zero lift when you release you should be able to hold your own if it's nine knots then you should get a couple of knots of lift hopefully hopefully more but you've got to do the sums so it does depend on the zero climb rate but um you do have to, have to add on a little bit more for your sink rate before you release so if you climb at five knots and you suddenly get seven knots on the vario you'll probably only be going up at half a knot or a knot by the time you release if you want a proper thermal it needs to be better than that eight nine or even off the clock to be honest i tend to wait until you get pretty much off the clock uh lift and yeah if you're under a cloud or a good good area then great you can move around um but if you've only got one cumulus that you're towing to 
then you need to wait and make sure that you can climb under the, that cumulus or and you, you're sure it's going to give you a lift or you've got enough height to get to some other likely area that's going to allow you to climb. So how high should you tow? Um, everybody tows to 2,000 feet, but actually as high as, high as possible, well, yeah, if you've got very deep pockets, but you've got to ask yourself how it's got to be high enough to reach an area that will give you a chance of soaring. And I'm amazed sometimes that it, sometimes I'll take a five or even higher thousand foot area tow and away from you know where, where i fly at cyford sometimes as Ch cheshire gap air comes in if you take a good high aerito you can get to the cumulus and get yourself away from that air and have a really nice day soaring once i did a couple of hundred k on a day and came back and nobody else unfortunately had soared all day because that air was in but all right i spent a lot of money on, on an aerito but i spend a lot of money on other stuff in gliding <laughs> and <laughs> um you know um you can normally glide back through that air especially if you can cloud climb which i enjoy doing um but even if you can climb up to the you know nice high cloud base if it was five thousand feet you can you can fly 50 kilometers um in in a good glider safely from that um depending on the wind obviously so um tow as high as you need to to get to you know a few options where you, where you can saw what we got here uh if you release off the clock lift do you turn straight after release i would say so <laughs> it's 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 there isn't it tom edwards depends on where you where you, what you're flying performance wise that's true obviously everything i say tonight depends on your circumstances the wind you know if it's a 50 knot wind then you're not going to get anywhere but you know but watch the tug what do you mean watch the tug don't understand <laughs> okay what else have we got let's go back um so that's really all i want to say about aerotain i mean the value for money thing frustrates me sometimes if you if you spend thousands of pounds on gliding every year and you know it's always a good idea to spend an extra you know 20 quid on an aerotain to to get you the extra two, three, four thousand feet um, and away for a good day, but then I don't get that many days off. So um, if I can get away and have a good day, then I'll I'll do all I can to to do that. Took us a very good area, yeah. It can it can be good, yeah. Paul, oh, sometimes if it's windy, lift may be broken lower down. You need a high enough to grab a good thermal. That's true, yeah, and especially if um yeah if you've got high cloud bases so if the cloud base is up at five thousand feet or something then it, it's going to be much easier to get away from an aerotow if you tow to like three thousand feet in a good area you'll get away if you take a winch launch you know at three o'clock in the afternoon or something with the cloud base up at five and a half thousand feet it's it can be very difficult to get away in that situation uh, for me, I always have a plan in your head what you're going to do rather than wait until you've launched. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say that, Graham. Um, always have a plan. And if you if you if you're on the on the queue, I was I have another another survey, actually. But I, I don't think I'll bother with it. If, if you're in the queue and you get to the front of the, the winch queue or the aerator queue and you look at the sky and you think, I can't saw. There's no way I can saw. Then. You know, pull off and wait until you can saw. Um, there's no point in going if you, if you can't saw. Um, okay, let's just move on. So there's other other clues as well to finding lift. Obviously, uh, the picture gives gives one of the clues away. Um, I'll probably do another presentation on how to join a gaggle and how to stay in the correct position in the gaggle. But if there's if there's other gliders flying and, and, and thermaling, then then that's often a good sign. Although it can depend who it is, and it, <laughs> um, especially if, if there's an instructor practicing turning, you you go and join them, uh, you, you might have a problem. But yeah, um, what other things? We've got buzzards, yeah. Um, tractors working fields, yeah, all the, all the thermal. Um, 
or thermal uh, triggers as well. But yeah, if there's another thermal uh, thermal glider, especially if you can get on on the radio, one thing I'd be cautious of is um, using the you, you you can have a look on your flam radar before you launch as well of course if you've got that in your glider and see what other people are climbing up but please once you've launched keep your keep your head out of the cockpit and you know just use use your eyes to figure out where you're going because if they're up a thousand feet above you or two thousand feet above you then it may be that you need a newer thermal than them they'll they'll be in this in this bubble that we talked about earlier so um, don't don't rely on somebody else climbing up really high. You you've got to do your own thing. Um, okay, yeah, paragliders. What's mag Steve? What's magic dust? Is that just you generally? Chris go on Facebook Live. <laughs> yeah, that's it. What a legend. Right. Um, did you call me a legend the other day? I think I need to call you a legend, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um what i want to just do is talk a little bit about various what we got here 46 minutes oh god we're overrunning um talk a little bit about various and then we'll probably we'll probably knock it on the head at, at that stage so what i've got here is um, in it let me uh you know make myself full screen oh dear great hair um what i got here is a bog standard winter varia um and some of you have seen me do this before we've got nothing better to do <laughs> keep going yeah <laughs> well there is that at the moment isn't there i've got a flask i've got an awful lot of pipe All right so what i'm going to do here is is plumb up a varia system Oh no, I haven't brought my um, haven't brought my total energy system. I haven't brought my total energy tube. Never mind. So I'm going to plug the total energy tight side to the static, and I'm going to plug the flask in. Oh, you can't see what I'm doing, can you? Okay, here we go, and maybe I could have done this beforehand. Okay, so this is a, a powerful total energy tube. This is how it's connected in my glider. Let's move back a little bit. We've got we got the flask, yeah. the flask connected to the flask side of the vario, and we've got a big long pipe here, which is meters and meters long. So this is the thing. You didn't watch enough Blue Peter, quite right. Um, this is the thing that connects onto the total energy tube. Now, I should have brought the total energy tube in, but I haven't. So we'll have to just simulate the total energy tube, but it, it's the same thing. So if we if we go up in the air, then the pressure reduces. So if, oh, it's hard to do this because it's opposite. Right. So the pressure reduces. So if I suck on here. It shows lift. Okay. Now, <laughs> um, yeah, it might be entertaining for you. Right. Now, the one, but the thing that I want to show you is I've got all this tube. So this is about the same length of tube that would be in your glider. Okay. Um, now, vario lag. What causes vario lag? Let's go. Stop it, Steve. <laughs> Five people tighten. Inertia of the glider. Quite right. Length of the tube. Inertia of the airflow. Inertia. Okay. So some of you have probably got the right answer there. And it takes a lot of momentum to move the glider up. Exactly. Because a lot of people think that... Um, Vario lag is caused by something that's happening in the glider. Now, it is the whole system, including the glider, 
But what I want to demonstrate to you here is that I'm going to blow loudly over this tube and I want you to see how long it takes for the vario to show lift. OK, so I hope oh, this is horrible because it's a mirror image or something. Right. So what I'm going to do is blow and you'll hear me blow. And then I want you to tell me how long it takes for the vario. And bearing in mind, this is a normal flask. Yeah, the normal, you know, bog standard 19th century type, you know, kit. Nothing, nothing, nothing electronic here. Um, how long does the varia take to actually show this lift? Are you ready? Three, two, one. Anybody see that? I'll blow, for, I'll blow a bit longer. Oh, I'll bust my varia. <laughs> Or 20th century, probably. 25 seconds, 0.25 seconds. Or maybe, maybe that's the uh, maybe that's the the lag in the uh, in the video conferencing thing. But um, it's instant. As as far as I was con concerned, it was instant. Yeah, thanks, Chris. You took that good good measurement there. So just. One one little piece of advice about um, thermal centering, and then I guess we'll probably have to knock it on the head and talk about actually thermal centering and um, um, uh, and the techniques you use use for that uh, on 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 a different on a different night. But um, what what I would say is that uh, hold on a minute. There we go. That's what I want. What happens is that when you are going up properly in the glider, so you cruise into a thermal and you start to feel the acceleration of the thermal, then the vario will tell you that you're going up a few seconds after you start going up. Yeah. Um, if you get a gust blown at the nose of the glider, that will increase the lift on the wing. So because you're instantly increasing the lift on the wing. So you blow air at the glider, the wing produces lift and you blow air at the trailing edge of this tube here. And that reduces the pressure instantaneously. So you, you, there's a gust blows at the glider, you feel a bump. And at exactly the same time, the pressure behind the turtle energy tube reduces. So you will feel a bump. You'll feel maybe even a, quite a big surge. And at exactly the same time, your variometer will increase. If that happens, that is a gust. And you shouldn't use that as a real thermal. But if you feel the lift, smoothly and then sometime later because of the inertia of the glider it takes a while say you're coming down at six knots and then you're going up at six knots that's 12 knots that's about 15 miles an hour you can't instantly accelerate the glider 15 miles an hour it takes a few seconds to do that and that's what what's taking a while for the varia to respond to so what i'm trying to say is that if it's a gust you'll get the feeling of acceleration and you'll get the varia showing you lift at exactly the same time. If it's a real thermal, you'll feel a gentle, um, well, you've, or even a, a really good push in the in the pants. And then sometime later, you'll feel the varia start to in, you'll see the varia start to increase. So that's how you can tell the difference between real thermal and a gust. Because how many of you, and me included, have sat there, felt a gust, saw the, saw the area gone up, think, that's brilliant, started turning, and there's no lift there at all. It, the area just goes, and then you go round and round and round, thinking, well, it was here a minute ago, but it's, but it's not here anymore. The reason for that is because it's a gust and not real, not real lift. Um, 
Does the fancy ball got dynamics work? Do the expensive electronic LX uh, do any filtering? Some Varios have um, accelerometers in them. Um, I've got one in my glider. Um, I don't like it because it doesn't tell me what I've, I'm used to. <laughs> I've got an accelerometer in me in me bum. Um, some some Varios do have accelerometers in them. I I I'm not keen myself. I don't know what other people think of them, but they should take into account the acceleration and gust and try and filter out the gusts. Um, but um, I, I haven't heard anybody say that this is the most amazing thing that, that since, since sliced bread. I don't know if anybody wants to correct me on here. Um, I think just the last thing I'm probably going to do is go through... A little bit about the um, no you're right it's not is it especially not at the moment um, a little bit about the accelerations you feel as you as you go through a thermal so as we pass through the side in this case of a thermal what a lot of people do is they tend to um, start um, turning when they feel the maximum acceleration the maximum kick in the in the bottom as they go through this lift but actually if you think about it if you get in the lift you press the up button you feel lots of acceleration to start with until the lift is going up at the maximum rate when the lift's going up at the maximum rate the acceleration stops and at that stage you're going up at the maximum rate and then you feel the opposite at the top so actually as we're cruising along towards the middle of this thermal we feel the maximum acceleration at this point here when we get to the middle of the thermal and sorry we feel the maximum acceleration about here yeah as we're going towards the middle of the thermal and then in the middle of the thermal that acceleration stops and it starts to reduce. Yeah. So when should we start turning? When the acceleration starts at the maximum acceleration or when the acceleration stops? What do you reckon? When it stops. Yeah, exactly. So that again that's a common misconception so as we're cruising towards this first climb we're waiting for that acceleration in our let's um let's say we're doing the, the whole winch thing so we're waiting for the acceleration so we're feeling negative acceleration here and then it might start to increase a little bit and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and at this point the acceleration stops at that point we need to start turning because it's at that point um that you're actually in the maximum lift. Um, okay, let's have a little look. Um, I think we've done what we've we done an hour now. So um, I think that'll probably do for now. Um, there's, I think what we should probably do is get somebody, maybe not me, but um, somebody else to do something on um, on how you should um, actually centre using various and, and using sensations. Um, but uh, has anybody got any questions before we uh, before we give it a rest? Does anybody think think I've said anything controversial that might be unsafe? I always worried about that. I always worry about that kind of stuff. <laughs> Sant, I learned how to thermal. Thanks, Sant. I'm sure you didn't. <laughs> Can you get the slides? Oh, I should think so. We'll stick them somewhere. I mean, th this this whole presentation obviously will be uh, is recorded, so it'll be it'll be online. It'll be on YouTube. I think it'll be on YouTube, won't it, uh, Matt?
Greg, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I should have probably done it. We should probably do them all at the same time. I, I'm sure I will do some other stuff. Um, oh, Matt says it's on YouTube now. Okay, cool. Um, can you download the slides? Yeah, I'll um, I'll have a look and um, I'll I'll figure out some method of uh, of putting the slides online. Um, I haven't. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I won't do it now. But uh, but yeah, I will do. When's the next one? Yeah, I'm not sure. Do you know when? When's um, I think Sant's doing one. Um, yeah, it's a good point. When's the next one, Matt? Ah, oh, we got a link there. Yeah, did did uh, did the um, software and stuff work okay? Yeah, yeah, son. If you're still there, um, do you want to tell us what you're going to talk about? I'm, I'm assuming going cross country or getting away or something in wave. Yeah, so Sant says, yep, yeah, next Saturday, start off with an overview, setting boundaries and aircraft performance. Brilliant. Next Saturday. We might we might do something uh, in between. We'll um, we'll we'll stick some stuff on them um, on the BJ website and we'll uh, we'll see what we can do. Well, I think I'll probably do for now. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, and thanks for all the interactions. That was that was ace. It was really nice to uh, to get that that feedback. So, uh, um, yeah, thanks so much. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll finish things off now. Ta.